doing conspecifics in allopatry compared to heterospecifics in stenopatry. And so this suggests that either um, there's <coughs> frequently geographically local speciation events with respect to the range size of these species, or that there's frequently um, gene flow between closely related taxa and sympatry. But regardless, the point is that if you take genetic divergence alone as a metric for species differences, in these systems, you will get very, very confused about where species boundaries are. And I think this speaks really nicely to uh, the point that Lacey, in, in this paper that came out this year, um, makes, and which I think is the impetus for this symposium, that if we apply species delimitation models to spatially structured data, we'll readily confound geographic structure with species boundaries. And this is really problematic, particularly in cases like the cichlids, where there's very, very strong spatial genetic structure. And I think this cartoon sums up this point really well. Um, we get really confused about, in, in these kinds of situations, whether about whether we're identifying species boundaries or population structure. And my goal here today is to talk about the implications this has for larger, for studying larger scales, larger scale patterns and diversity. Um, particularly, why is confounding population structure with species boundaries problematic for macroevolutionary studies? I'm going to make three brief points here. First of all, this is problematic because geographic structure does not always lead to speciation. And if we're defining geographically structured populations as species, this makes our interpretation of what's actually going on in the diversification process really difficult. Connected to this, um, it really inhibits our ability to study the link between population structure and diversification rates. And lastly, it leads to biased taxon sampling, um, which is problematic for analyses of larger scale diversification rates and patterns. So I'll briefly touch on each of these three points, um, using cichlids as a, a organizing themes. So um, to get at this point of how geographic structure does not always lead to speciation, one of the really fantastic cases of morphological diversity in Lake Tanganyika is this genus called Tropius, where there are dozens of these color variants. And if we look at the geographic distribution of these color variants, they're by and large allopatric. They're distributed, they live on rocky habitats, they're distributed at distinct little rocky patches, and little rocky patches have different allopatric color variants. So there are dozens of these. But there are low levels of sympatric diversity in this genus. And most of the lake, you find two of these types together. Um, in a restricted part of the lake, you can find up to four together. But what this suggests is that although this genus seems to have no trouble forming geographic variants, there's a fundamental disconnect between the origins of these geographic variation, variants and the buildup of diversity in sympatry in, these genus, or in this genus. Otherwise, we would see communities with dozens of tropius variants in sympatry. And so this speaks to the point that speciation begins with population differentiation, but it also involves the origin of barriers to gene flow, so these things don't completely intermix when they come into secondary contact. And it also involves the persistence of species through time, which may relate to whether or not they have barriers to gene flow, may also relate to things like ecological coexistence in the country. And so any of these can be rate limiting steps in diversification, not just population differentiation. And so assuming those, that populations are species is fundamentally problematic if we want to understand actual processes of diversification and how diversity builds through time. So related to this, um, it, we get really confused if, if, about this issue if we're defining populations as species, if we're seeking to study the link between population structure and diversification rates. And I would argue that the understanding of this link between population structure and diversification rates is a fundamental connection between micro and macroevolution that needs a lot of additional study. This is not something that we understand well. So on one hand, we could hypothesize that strong population geographic structure facilitates diversification, but really it is this uh, population uh, differentiation is what is limiting in the diversification process. And so more opportunities for that 
will lead to increased diversification rates. But we could ar also argue just the opposite, that strong population geographic structure limits diversification, that low effective population sizes lead to high levels of local extinction, low efficacy of selection, and decreased speciation rates. And Mike Harvey and co-authors have recently published um, a, a paper in PNA, PNAS um, uh, that is in agreement with the first of these hypotheses. They find the positive association between population genetic differentiation and speciation rates in birds. But there are other studies, so this is a paper on orchids, that find no such pattern. And in this paper, they quote, levels of neutral genetic variation within species do not affect either pay diversification in any way. And so this is a really open question that needs additional study. And so again, I'd argue that this connection between population genetic structure and clay diversification is a key link between micro and macro evolution that we don't understand very well. Um, and confounding population genetic structure with species boundaries fundamentally impedes our ability to study this relationship. Finally, one um, last short bit about how confounding population structure with species um, can lead to biased taxon sampling that are problematic and analyses of diversification rates and patterns. If we again return to this trophies example, if we called all of these allopathic variant species, and I should say that by and large there's no evidence for any um, barriers to gene flow between these morphs when you put them into contact, they interbreed. But if we did call all of these allopathic variant species, you would find a spurious relationship between the geographic range size of this genus and species richness of the genus. And that's fundamentally problematic if we're interested in understanding patterns of species richness. So for example, uh, we've done work looking at how species, species richness relates to lake area. Uh, range sizes of these lake adaptive radiations are fundamentally restricted by the size of these lakes. And so if we were including this counts of species that were um, linked to limited by range size, then this would be a highly circular exercise. And so for that reason, in doing all of this work, we've been very careful to use species richness estimates that do not include purely allopatric variants. Because otherwise, we're confounding, um, we're, we have an inability to compare data across lakes of different sizes. And for those of you who at some point in your, in your career tried to read the papers and you've been really confused about how many species are in different places because different paper, papers about the same place list highly different numbers of species, don't worry, it wasn't because you anything that you did, it's because people use highly different estimates of species richness, and this is fundamentally about whether they count or don't count allopatric variants. So this is a plot of Lake Malawi species richness with and without allopatric variants, and what you can see is you can nearly double the number of species lake by counting allopatric variants. So what do we need to do? Um, first of all, I think we need to think really carefully about sp spatial analysis of population genomic data because we have a tremendous amount of power, um, but with that power allows us uh, ample opportunity to do way too much <coughs> splitting. Um, I think we need to think really carefully about what are the controls on species persistence, and there have been some recent really nice papers um, making this point in various contexts, um, but I think this is a neglected subject in speciation research in general. And finally, uh, I think that we need to think more clearly about links between population genetic structure and diversification rates, and what evidence we have for these links, and in what taxa we have evidence for these links, and what taxa we don't. 